Hello and welcome back to um, all of you, or welcome if you're here for the first for the first um, event. Um, it's lovely to see so many faces here in the audience, and it's lovely to know that there are so many people watching online as well. So thank you for that. As usual, I'll just go through a few housekeeping notes. Just I'm sure you're bored with it if you've heard it already, but I'll just do it for those that haven't. Um, if you're interested in buying a book at the end. The booksellers are outside Blackwell's. Um, you can purchase books there and you can also um, queue up to have your book signed as well if you're in the audience. If you're watching online, you can, have, you can purchase books via the link there as well. Um, we have speech to text captioning and we also have BSL for those who require it. Uh, what was the other thing I needed to say? Questions, questions. <laughs> if you have questions at the end and you're in the room, please raise your hand and a roaming mic will be going round. If you have questions and you're watching online, you can put your question into the text box as well. Now, I will introduce our speakers for our next panel. So chairing the event is Dr Nandini Das, who's a professor. Professor? Professor! <laughs> she is a professor. You are a professor. You are. You are a professor of early modern English literature and culture and a fellow of Exeter College at the University of Oxford. Um, you're, uh, she's a scholar of Renaissance literature, travel, migration and cross-cultural encounters and has published widely on these topics from their appearance in the writings of major 16th and 17th century authors like Philip Sidney, Shakespeare and Cervantes. Um, to the fleeting presence of three Japanese boys in 16th century Portuguese Goa in India, Portuguese held Goa in India. Her latest book, Courting India, which she spoke about last year, actually, at um, the festival, Courting India, um, England, Mughal India, and the Origins of Empire, was the 2023 winner of the British Academy Book Prize for Global Cultural Understanding. So, bravo. <laughs> And she's here to speak with William Dalrymple, um, who is an award-winning historian, author, and broadcaster. He's written and presented three television series, one of which has won the Grierson Award for Best Documentary Series at BAFTA. His works of non-fiction include the best-selling Wolfson Prize-winning White Moogles, The Last Moogle, um, which won the Duff Cooper Prize, and The Hemingway and... Co I'm going to mispronounce this. OK. <laughs> I am very sorry. I am very sorry. Award-winning Return of the King. He's here today to speak about his highly acclaimed book, The Anarchy, The Relentless Rise of the East India Company. I will hand over to you now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. So we're going to start in a world of big business, where big business is richer and more powerful than any nation state where big business plays lottery, in certain cases, literal lottery, with the fortunes of individual ordinary people, their lives, their happiness, um, their sustenance, and their futures. Um, where big business might occasionally be worth more than the combined GDP of any single nation. That doesn't sound very strange to us because we're used to navigating precisely such a world. But Will Dalrymple has perhaps done more than any other living historian to show us one of the most crucial historical moments where that pattern was established in London, in a very small part of London, in fact, but in a way that fixed the destinies of nations halfway across the world including the part of the globe where I come from, which is the Indian subcontinent. Um, I was looking at one of your very early interviews um, when the anarchy came out, um, and you said that what you wanted to answer was the question of how a single business operation based in one London office complex managed to replace the mighty Mughal Empire, which is which sounds really odd, doesn't it? When you put it so bluntly. <laughs> but that is exactly what happened. Um, and you chart this so wonderfully, right from its early stages, to that point where the Mughal Empire is really fragmented and taken apart, in a way. Um, so let's start at the very beginning, you know, with London, that little part of London. <laughs> 
where the story begins. The rise of the East India Company and the London merchants. Can you tell us a little bit about what struck you as particularly interesting about that group of people um, and their money? So, first of all, this feels quite wrong that you should be interviewing me, Anthony, <laughs> because I'm old hat and uh, I'm, I'm sure everyone in this room knows Nandini is the new superstar of this field <laughs> uh, who has won not only the prize that was mentioned for the British Academy but about four other prizes uh, in the last year with her spectacular book, Courting India. So although we're going to talk about my book, you should actually go out and buy Courting India immediately at Blackwell's. Uh, You're far too uh, kind, <laughs> but now answer my question. <laughs> <laughs> She is Professor Das. <laughs> so the year in question is 1599, which, as mm. you know best than anyone, is the same year that Shakespeare tossed off a couple of plays, Hamlet and Julius Caesar. Just a minor year. Just a minor year. Yeah. Uh, and if, let's imagine for ourselves, Hamlet, uh, sorry, not Hamlet, Shakespeare, sitting um, somewhere near downstream from the Globe Theatre and getting stuck halfway through a speech to be, <laughs> or, <laughs> and he decides to go for a walk. Mm. So he could, in, if he was in September, which is probably when he was yeah. finishing mm -hmm. um, that play, uh, if he was to have got off uh, from uh, the riverside, crossed London Bridge, turned right, he might, in as little as 20 minutes, have found himself at the Founders Hall, mm -hmm. uh, where, a meeting was taking place at, in Moorgate Fields. Now, in those days, Moorgate Fields were fields rather than the grotty tube station. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and <laughs> and uh, gathered in that room was a whole group of people. And we know exactly who's there because their names are preserved here mm. in the British Library. And in, we should say that I think uh, most of your research and my research... Absolutely. Uh, is sitting under our feet at this moment uh, in the bowels of the British Library, where legend at least has it, there's 35 miles of East India Company material, <laughs> uh, if one go backwards and forwards down the corridors. Um, and the meeting had been called um, by uh, a London businessman whose father was in charge of the customs, who was like the... VJ Malia uh, uh, of his day, Sir Thomas Smythe, uh, who was this um, rich entrepreneur with a kind of stovepipe hat and a ruff in his picture. Uh, and he was playing on a sort of um, brexit -y theme um, in that it was a moment very like the current when Britain had done one, or England rather, had done one of its... Um, periodic moments of, uh, of telling the French and everyone else to F off, uh, particularly the Spanish, uh, and in that case, in, in the Reformation. Mm. And what provoked this meeting was a bunch of Dutch entrepreneurs coming <laughs> and trying to buy boats uh, to sail to India here in London. And Smythe says, come on, guys, we can't have the Dutch buying our ships in order to make money with our ships. Uh, we should have the gumption to get our uh, stuff together and found our own company. And he does just that. And in the bowels beneath us is the document mm. uh, made on the 12th of September, 1599, when the first entry is the Lord Mayor of London. Yeah. And then there's all these other grandees giving their £2,000 to the Lord Mayor. And it goes down. And about 20 pages later, there are people who are describing themselves as haberdashers. Exactly. As yeah. vintners, leather workers. In other words, small businessmen with a little bit of spare cash. And these guys are the first investors kind of in world history in, in, in that the corporation, something's completely ordinary to us, the idea that people would come together, pool their capital and go out and... Uh, found a business operation jointly uh, was a brand new Tudor idea. Not completely brand new. In the, I think 1558 is the first one, which is the yeah. Muscovy Company. And there's a huge range of them cropping up from exactly that point onwards, isn't and, it? And it's exactly like anyone old enough. Companies. Exactly. Anyone old enough to remember Mrs. T's 
privatization of the post office, and suddenly there's kind of share issue, and everyone goes into the, and, and buys. Share. This is what it's it's a fashion. It's new. Yeah. And um, but there's something unusual about these joint stock trading companies, isn't it? Like you were saying. Um, it allows ordinary people, the shoemakers and the rope makers of London, with a little bit of spare cash to invest it for their hopeful 100% return. But there's um, something else in terms of its licensing, which gives them enormous freedom. Exactly. And, and, and it's different. I mean, all the way through the Middle Ages, you had guilds. Mm. So if you go off to Suffolk uh, on a nice weekend like this and go and stay somewhere like Lavenham or Long Melford, you find these guild halls. But to be part of that world, you had to be a rich merchant. Yeah. And you had to be admitted, and there were, like the livery companies today, there are ceremonies of admission and, uh, and so on. And it's a grand thing for grand folk. Absolutely, yes. This is different in anyone, whether they work in the wool trade or they are vintners or leather workers or whatever they are, can just put that little bit of capital in and risk it. Mm. And they might lose it or they might get more back, depending on the success of this. And this is a hugely important Elizabethan innovation that normally when people talk about the things that uh, you know, in the old style books that India owes to Britain and, mm. they, and the list is democracy, tea and those uh, universities and that sort of stuff. Actually, probably the, the one that's lasted longest and changed India most is the idea of a corporation. Yeah. Uh, this is something which you know, almost everyone today that goes to work will work in some sort of uh, joint stock corporation is mm. now it's now the norm, but it's an idea which is a, you know which has a beginning just as much as yeah. railways or um, tarmac you know has a, has a <laughs> has a has an invention and a, and a moment when it comes into being. And it's and very different from the other model, which is the Portuguese model, which, which is state the, run. Which is the state run, the Estado de India, mm. uh, and it's very very successful. And the and the the model that the Elizabethans promote, has a whole royal charter attached to it, which not only gives you the right to do the things you might expect it to do, like trade in the Indies, which mm -hmm. is the key thing. Earned but lots of money as well, which is the other key thing. But also the right to wage war, mm -hmm. mint coins, keep prisoners, and there's this long list, and it's there, right there at 1599, right at the beginning of this story. Uh, and it, it's almost sort of prescient. They, they were really anticipating. And as we've seen, there's a wonderful book called um, Empire Inc., which I'm sure you mm. know, Phil Stern's new yes. book, yeah. came out this year. And far more than I'd realised when I wrote the book four years ago, similar sorts of companies. There's the Royal Africa Company a little mm. bit later, which is trading in slaves. There is the Hudson Bay Company, still going, yeah. which is uh, doing beavers and pelts and, and that kind of stuff. And uh, there is the Rhode Island Company, which is, which is where you know, Providence is now. And the Virginia Company, opening up yeah. uh, settlement in Virginia. And so what you find during this period of Elizabethan colonialism, which we kind of imagine with sort of chaps in, you know, in hoses and sort of mm. tights and, uh, and all that sort of stuff. Actually, it's from the beginning, it's not about state power, it's about corporate and economic power. And it's corporations doing this for profit and taking risks, and some of the risks uh, fail. Uh, you know, there are yeah. some, many early colonies in America I mean, this is two years later empty with, with sort of mysterious absence of any colonies. Uh, Roanoke, uh, which has just preceded, I think, this uh, East India Company, is it 1580s? 1580s, yes. Yeah. Um, so we've got to that point where the East India Company ha is, has come into being. Um, it's being bankrolled by merchants, but also by these collective kind of ordinary people of England. Um, but the decision making at the heart of it is held by a very small group of people, isn't it? One of the things that really comes across so well in the anarchy is the sheer mismatch in terms of the size and the impact that the East India Company had in, in, in India. So. The, if you look at the, there's two early prints mm. of the of the East India Company headquarters, which from 
kind of about 20 years after its founding, sits in one place for the rest of its life in Lenin yeah. Hall Street, uh, under what's now the Richard Rogers Lloyd Building, although there's no plaque to mark anything. You know, arguably, the most important thing the British ever did uh, happened out of that building, and yet there's not a reference to it, and no it's, one learns yeah. this stuff in their, in their school history classes. But the, out of that one building, initially something that looks a bit like a Tudor pub, mm. with a warehouse downstairs and a little balcony, and then a, a top floor where there's some offices, a nice picture of jolly, jolly sort of ships on high seas uh, over the top of it. And um, that, by the early... 18th century has been transformed into this flat-fronted but tiny mm. building which has five windows wide. It's a lot smaller than this grand complex at the British Library. So how many people would work there usually? Well, initially, it didn't even... For the first 20 years, it's in, it's in Thomas Smythe's back, back office. Exactly, and he used to put yeah. people up in his <laughs> own home, isn't it? <laughs> and, and then it has the office, and... and it, even, even before it has the, bought its own office in Lendhall Street, it has a dock. Mm. It invests in docks before it has an office, uh, which is interesting. Yeah. And um, initially, no, tiny skeleton staff. And even, even when we get to the things beginning to take off at the time of the Battle of Plassey, yeah. only 200 white Brits in Bengal at that time. Uh, it's extraordinary. And the trick... We're moving forward now, mm. but yeah. the trick that the company pulls off, uh, and it is an extraordinary trick, and to us today, or even more so when, if you know, I'm talking about this in India, baffling today for our sensibilities, the company realises that it can buy mercenary soldiers who will enforce its will, the sepoys, mm -hmm and recruit them locally in India. Initially from Telangana, and they're called Telangas right up, mm. by, by Indians right up until the mid-19th century. Uh, then often from UP and Bihar. And in order to pay these guys, they borrow money from Indian bankers, many of them Mawari, mm. guys from Rajasthan, uh, uh, who've moved for tax breaks to Calcutta, and Calcutta by this point is a bit like Dubai or Singapore, no one pays tax. Yeah. Um, and so all the merchants and all the money lenders race off there for this opportunity of, of, of being free from arbitrary mm. uh, taxation by rulers. And the one thing that they have to do is they have to be open to lending to the company. And so the company, with a skeleton staff of a couple of hundred white civil servants, and a razor thin at the beginning officer class mm. that's only 5% of the army that is white conquers the richest country in the world. And just to give you the relative scales of the, of the wealth, these figures can be argued over and scholars do, but roughly speaking, England is producing between 4 and 7% of the world's GDP. Mughal India is producing about 40% of the world's GDP. And yet it is conquered by that, not by that poorer country, but by one business operation out of mm. one office, five windows wide, using local Indian soldiers with, paid with money borrowed from local Indian bankers. Mm. I mean, it's a good deal it's, it's, for the company. <laughs> it is, and it's astonishing, isn't it? Bonkers. Now, you mentioned that you know, the company, in a way, is separate from the state, which it is, but the state really siphoned off much of the advantage of this as well, isn't it? Because the other competitor, major competitor, are the French. And let, how shall we put it? The Eng England didn't quite get on with the French at this point. Funny that. <laughs> Um, so, yes, so the, well, the, we have to add in the Scots at this point, mm. because um, yeah. uh, it is a Scotsman, actually, uh, Jean-Law de Loriston, mm. who, having fled Edinburgh, having um, fought a duel on a, over a point of honour, goes to France and says, look, you're missing out, guys. Uh, those pesky English 
uh, have uh, are just creaming it mm. in uh, uh, in India. You need to have a company de Zand. Mm. So the Company de Zand is founded by Lord de Lauriston, and he sends his two sons, Jean and Jacques, out there to, to help manage it. And there is a point in the 1740s, under this, this very wily governor called Duplé, mm. when it's doing rather better than the English equivalent. And Duplé is making very clever alliances, particularly the Nizam of Hyderabad, and is manoeuvring the English into a corner. At one point, takes Madras. Yeah. And there is a perfectly plausible what if of history that, in, that, that the Brits don't get India at all. It goes mm. over to the French. And the person who does more than anything to stop Duplé is this fascinating, horrible, evil character called Robert Clive. We need statue, a metaphorical drum roll. Yeah. Here, <laughs> whose statue still stands outside the Foreign Office to this day. Yeah. Um, although he was disgraced in his own lifetime, and the statue only is put up for very different reasons in 1905 by Lord Curzon. Yeah. Um, at the same sort of time as in the South of America, Confederate generals are having statues <laughs> of themselves being put up in the South. And so, anyway, Clive is a fascinating character. And he is very much a central character in the anarchy, isn't it? Along with Charles. He's my, he's my Lord Voldemort. He's my <laughs> <laughs> so let's roll back a little bit. You mentioned the Battle of Plassey um, earlier on. Shall we start that part of the story, okay. perhaps, and bring Clive in? So Robert Clive is brought up in Shropshire, and he is a badden from the beginning. <laughs> uh, and his... Here in the British Library, we have his uncle's mm. letters. And his uncle is pulling his hair out, saying, oh, God, <laughs> what do we do with Robert? Um, and he, at one point, he is running basically an extortion racket in Shepton Mallet or somewhere like that. Well, you've uh, got to start somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> is it Shepton Mallet? No, it's Sherbourne. It's Sherbourne, where he threatens age 17 or 16 or 15, I mean, something very young, mm to divert the town stream into somebody's shop unless they pay him off. <laughs> uh, or throw windows, the stones through their windows. Uh, and at one point, it's, the uncle says, maybe we can get him in the church. And that one doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> Barchester Towers could have been a slope character. Um, but instead, they have some cousin who's connected with the East India Company. Yeah. And age 16, he goes off. And it goes very badly from the beginning because he mm. falls off the boat somehow. It's quite difficult to do, presumably. <laughs> uh, and and the, the, some, uh, only sort of five minutes later do some of them realise that Clive is, <laughs> is, is sort of bobbing about. The, <laughs> Desperately uh, trying to catch up. And then... And ten seconds, <laughs> <laughs> wait for me. And then he loses his luggage in Brazil. Mm -hmm. And then he doesn't like India and tries to shoot himself when he arrives. Mm. Uh, so, I mean, it's not, an off, not a promising start, but it, everything has changed when this rivalry between the French and the English yeah. get going. The only thing that doesn't change is that his dislike for India never Remains goes. the same. <laughs> Clive of India hated India. Yeah. Hated Indians, <laughs> took no interest in, in India, in its Well, culture. he loved the loot. He liked the money. <laughs> he liked the money, liked the gold. And so Clive of India... Um, Life is transformed, Robert Clive, when this, this rivalry with France. And when the French take Pondicherry, Clive manages to escape in disguise, blacks himself up using walnut oil. Right. And escapes to Fort St. David, which is another small British fort. And there he comes into the, uh, under the authority of a man called Thomas Stringer Lawrence who was a veteran of the Battle of Culloden and fought with Duke of Cumberland, Butcher Cumberland. Um, and Clive finds his métier, which, of course, is fighting. Mm. Mm. He's very good at it. And from that point, Clive never loses a battle, either on the battlefield against the French or against the Indians, or in the boardroom mm. uh, against rivalries like Sullivan, or in Parliament against rival politicians who are trying to impeach him, as happens twice. Yeah. And he is a master strategist. He knows in the way that a small-town bully 
can imagine him learning age 15 just how far he can push things, yeah. how aggressive he can And where be. people's weak points are. Where people's weak points. And particularly warfare in India at this period is often a chess game. Mm. Two armies march out, negotiations take place, tra horse trading, bribes. Um, Clive has no time for any of that. He attacks at night in a thunderstorm from the rear, at dawn, in the mist, before everyone's up. He terrifies his opponents, he breaks all the rules, and he brilliantly calculates their weaknesses. So he's, while he's a horrible character and a kind of brute in all sorts of ways, he's also brilliant. I mean, mm. he just never puts the foot wrong strategically. He, but he, he's also seen from both sides by the East India Company people and by the local princes and um, um, people, the army generals, as someone who kind of lacks civility in how to do war. Yeah. You know, but it's a weird thing. The, this concept of civility in the matter, of, small matter of killing people. And I, yeah, I mean, he, and he, he's 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 just rude. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> um, he, when he, after Buxer, when he becomes the, in 1765, he wins the second, first of Classy, mm. 1756, 1764, there's the Battle of Buxer, and he becomes the governor of Bengal, very powerful man. And he's, they, and they eat commonly, like in an Oxbridge cottage, and everyone's on the, and he sits there sort of sullen, mm. quiet angry, glowering at everybody. And he's not just, he's not, he's just not a very nice guy. Yeah. Uh, but when he's challenged, he never panics, he never loses it. He finds a way round a problem. And the audacity, and, and the Battle of Plassey is the best example of this, mm. because, so the story is, it's a good story, it's a good story. So we're just approaching what we in this country call the Seven Year War, what any Americans in the audience will know as the French and Indian Wars. Mm. And a piece of intelligence comes to the East India Company that the French are fitting a mighty fleet at Port L'Oreal and that that is aimed at wresting India mm. from the British. And everyone knows that sooner or later, it could be six months, it could be four months, that the French and the English are gonna burst into another round of warfare. And so Clive is recruited. He's come back from India, already made one fortune mm. after defeating Duple, lost that fortune in corrupt dealings in Parliament, rotten boroughs and that mm. kind of stuff, needs more money and is up for hire and is hired to take on this French fleet. So he sails halfway around the world to find there is no French fleet. In fact, the French fleet had been going off to Canada, to Halifax, to fight any Daniel Day-Lewis fans in the audience. They're, they're the last <laughs> of the Mohicans, all that jumping through waterfalls and all that. Um, and so he arrives to fight, it's feeling a bit silly. He's gone oh. six months around the world, and there's, you know, he imagines M Madras is going to be bombed out and the, with a tricolour flying over it or, or a royalist French flag flying over it. Nothing of the sort. And, of course, if he doesn't fight the French, he can't rebuild his fortunes. He can't rebuild his fortunes. And so he's, he's feeling very silly and doesn't mm. know what to do. And then the news comes that, that Siraj Dawla, the Mughal governor of Bengal, has invaded Calcutta. And this saves his career. Mm. He takes his task force up the Hooghly, recaptures Calcutta very easily, and writes to his father, Phew, we've sorted this out. Long, I, look, thank God this happened, because otherwise... Uh, we'd be completely wasted. And then the Seven Year War does break out and he then takes Chandanagar, the French. Yeah. But he's about to go back to Madras with kind of job done when a letter arrives and it comes from one of these bankers. Mm. And this banker is a man called the Jugget Set. And the Jugget Set is like the Rothschild of India. He's invented a brilliant banking system whereby at a time of disruption, when it's no longer possible to move gold around easily because bandits are going to seize it, he's invented a credit system, the yeah. Hundi system, whereby you can feed in your tax money to his office in Murshidabad and withdraw it from his office in Delhi. And, and that, he, again, is a wonderful thing about your book because this whole promissory system, which we think of as a Western it's there with these Invention. local bankers. Yeah, yeah, it's already there. 
And the Jagat set is astonishingly rich. And he doesn't like Sir Ajadana because he's been bad for business. He's attacked mm. Calcutta. He's you know, pissed off not just the Brits, but also made the other trading companies, the, the Danish, the Portuguese, the Dutch, and everyone else is up and down the, the Hooghly River trying to buy the very, very high-quality textiles that's made mm. by your Bengali ancestors uh, along the Hooghly. And he writes to Clive and says, look, I've got a deal for you. You've finished the French, you've recaptured Calcutta, but you've left the snake alive. No one leaves the snake alive. You've got to crush it. I will pay you, Robert Clive, one million pounds sterling. And in addition, I will pay the East India Company one million pounds if we can just borrow your troops, finish off Suraj Dada, effect a coup d'etat, mm -hmm. and put one of my guys, Mir Jaffa, in yep. charge. And Clive says, oh, all right. <laughs> <laughs> and doesn't check with anybody. He just goes ahead and does oh. it. And on the way, he's marching up from Calcutta, the letters from the Jagat set stops. And having initially got, you know, come, it'll all be ready for you, we'll set the whole thing mm. up. He marches closer and closer, and suddenly there's no sign yeah. of his ally. Two or three days passes, nothing happens. And he knows that Sir Dalla is now one day's march away, mm. entrenched at a hunting lodge called Plassey, which is named after the Palash tree. Mm. Uh, which is just coming out now in India, the gorgeous red flowers. Uh, I have one on my farm in Delhi. It was just <laughs> dropping these lovely red flowers as I was leaving last week. And um, he knows there's no going back. Mm. So just the day before, a sort of half-hearted letter comes from the Jagat Set, who's clearly getting cold feet, yeah. saying, I'm sure I'll be able to help and uh, just come along and it'll all mm. be OK. And Clive has this sleepless night wondering whether he's walking into a trap, mm. whether the, his allies are not going to be there. Anyway, the battle begins, and he finds this is, that he, he's only brought 40,000 troops or 20,000 troops. I can't remember the exact number. And, and Siraj Dowd has got sort of half a million or um, thousands and thousands of sepoys and heavy artillery. And then he's saved because there's a massive monsoon downpour. Mm. And... Immediately that it ends, there's a charge from the uh, Siraj Dawla's cavalry because they assume that no one can use their artillery after a mm. rainstorm. But the East India Company has invented the tarpaulin. Mm. Uh, and their, and their, and their uh, powder is dry. So the, the charge is met with a devastating volley. And from that point, the Indian uh, uh, offensive falls off. They've all got wet powder, they can't fight, they're only yeah. fighting with bayonets or with, with halberds or whatever. And um, Sirajudala flees the battlefield, Mir Jaffa walks off, Sirajudala is captured, his body is paraded through Mushidabad, and Clive walks into Mushidabad and just fills his pockets with jewels, some of which are on display at the V&A at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> the rest are in Powys Castle, a well, national trust property. But, and just finish this. He, he then punts the remains of the 11 boatloads mm. of gold down the Hooghly from Mushidabad to Calcutta. Years later, he's called before Parliament and asked, you had no authority. That no one said you could mm. do this. What are you doing taking a million pounds? He was the richest self-made man in Europe after this. And in a sort of Boris Johnson touch, <laughs> he says, um, my lords, the bankers of the city were on their knees in front of me. The doors of the treasury were thrown open. My lords, I was astonished at my own moderation. <laughs> uh, and everyone laughs. And rather like sort of Bob Johnson getting, you know, getting through early inquiries into mm. COVID parties and stuff, he gets away with it. But he's kind of marked and people begin to hiss him in the streets. Yeah. And he goes off on the grand tour, tries to buy some statues, but he's become now a symbol of corruption. And in the end, and this is kind of one of the strangest bits of the story, after being hooted at and hissed at in the London streets, one afternoon, in the middle of a game of whist, he goes 
into his loo and cuts open his veins with a paper knife and bleeds to death. Um, it's just Which kind of again, weird, it so is just odd, weird. isn't it? It's so Buried odd, but in also so grave. much in character yeah. for Clive. For a there's knife. a, I mean, do you think it would? Th there is something of that deep violence in him right from the beginning, though, isn't there? A Probably darkness then, then. right from his childhood, essentially, which we see. Now you've talked about. Um, Clive's defense of his moderation. But he's not the only one, is it? I mean, throughout your ca career, really, you've produced this wonderful quartet of books which looks at this period, um, and particularly at this coterie or breed of white Mughals. Tell us a little bit about this. And I know I'm veering off my brief here about talking about the anarchy, but the anarchy is so much a part of this larger Correct. trajectory. So there's, there's four books. There's the anarchy, which tells about the founding and the growth of these. Yeah. There is um, White Moguls, which is a micro story. It's a love story mm. set in, uh, in the court of Hyderabad over two years all, again, from material in this library. Mm -hmm. There is Return of a King, which is the moment of maximum hubris when the East India Company thinks it can just take Afghanistan. And of course, the whole, every, famously, one man, Dr. Bryden, makes it out on his pony. In fact, there are a few others, but mm. uh, it's a wipeout. And then there's The Last Mughal, which is the end of the story. And that tells the, the whole story from founding to uh, the, the suppression of the company. And White Mughals is this interesting thing because while the East India Company was the moment of maximum corruption, and it's very simple. that Everyone was out there in India to make money. Yeah. There was no complexity about that. No one was there to run an NGO. No one pretended this was a sort of diffid operation. Or indeed or... to rule a nation. I mean, that's <laughs> yeah. not part of their yeah. brief. Their brief is to Come turn a profit. Come a fortune. Yeah. Personal fortune and the company. Yeah. And by the um, you know, by seventies, eighties, these young men are coming home with a million pounds and buying up country houses, pissing everyone off. Mm. That, you know, all the old aristocracy don't like these sort of brash city boys as they see them. Yeah. Uh, coming up and, and, and not only do they buy country houses, they buy rotten boroughs and, and then end up having virtually their own block in Parliament. Mm. Um, so not only do they corrupt Parliament directly through bribes, and in 1690, which is exactly 100 years after, 1699, I think, exactly 100 years after founding the company, the governor is found passing Mohammed al fayed style brown envelopes of cash to MPs mm. in order to have the, his monopoly extended, and ends up in the... In the in the Tower of London, the very first case of mm. corporate corruption, of MPs being bribed by a by a, a, a corporation to affect a bit of legislation, something mm. that obviously happened in every legislature <laughs> ever since. Uh, and and then, then you have the whole business of lobbying. The East India Company invents corporate lobbying. Yeah. You don't just have to bribe people with money, but you can, you know, produce sweeteners, yeah. put people on boards. You can uh, give campaign donations. It couldn't happen today, <laughs> you know. Absolutely <laughs> not. Uh, and, uh, and, and that way, you get them to do what you want. Yeah. But thirdly, no, there's two other ways. And then you have the block of East India Company returned who bought into Parliament and bought a, mm. a rotten borough. So they have about 30 or 40 MPs of their own. Plus, 80% of MPs in the 18th century have shares in the East India Company. Yeah. So in four different ways and levels, the company is protected. And you get this thing beginning, which we still get today, with a million different uh, mm. corporate entities in, in, in every democracy in the country, whereby that mysterious alchemy whereby the in interests of a rich corporation miraculously becomes part of British foreign policy. Mm. I couldn't even name the arms manufacturers uh, sending <laughs> bombs to Gaza at the moment. In, uh, you know, but it's the same mm. sort of thing. Yeah. And the company develops that. The company develops that. But at the same time, 
This is the period when you have maximum intermarriage mm. and there is, up to a certain extent, much less colour prejudice than you get in the Victorian period. In the Victorian period, they clear out the corruption, but they separate the two yeah. peoples. And you get, uh, by the Victorian period, black town and white town, mm. you get the similar mile, no dogs and Indians, you get the white Sony clubs, all that whole stuff. But the East India Company, and again, we know this because of documents which are here, 100 feet away under our feet in the, yeah. in the vaults. The East India Company passed a law that everyone who came out to India for them had to leave a will because they were getting endless lawsuits from people wanting money, thinking that their son had made a fortune and then he yeah. dies and there's nothing. So they have this law that a will must be there, uh, made and one copy sent back to London. Those volumes, the big lead leather, red leather volumes, are sitting here yeah. under our feet. And what they show is that in the uh, 1780s, for example, one in three British men is leaving everything to an Indian woman or an Anglo-Indian child. Mm -hmm. yeah. In other words, this idea of Indians and Brits, you know, east is east and west, west and never the twain shall meet, the Kiplingy stuff, yeah. is later. It's so much later, isn't yeah. it? And it, it's a very concerted, as you said, it's a Victorian development. Absolutely that. In some senses. So that brings me to perhaps my final question before, or final couple of questions. If we're talking about this earlier period, about the East India Company, we've talked about how it began, we've talked about its corruption and its long history. What's the, the misconception about this period that annoys you the most? do you think? <laughs> well, I think what annoys me the most is that no one knows this stuff at all. <laughs> <laughs> it's not taught in our schools. You know. um, As you said, I mean, yeah. the East India Company headquarters are not even marked. What, what, what's been weird is that these four books, the Company Quartet, as it's now called by my publishers, and you can buy it in a box set. <laughs> you know, nice <laughs> um, these four books, Began, I began work on it in 1998, mm. 1999, put pen to paper. And in those 20 years, between then and now, the two main subjects of these four books, which is, on one hand, colonialism, and the other, the idea of a massive and monstrous corporation, mm. both those things have, have sort of gone centre stage. They weren't then. So on one hand, when I was, began work on White Moogles, there was no Google, mm. there was no Twitter, there was no, there was Microsoft, but there wasn't, uh, and there was Apple, but there wasn't uh, 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 any of the big social meta. Mm. Or, um, and in those 20 years, suddenly we got used to the idea that there are corporations which have, as you said at the beginning, got GDPs, got, uh, sorry, got, um, annual turnovers, which are more than the GDPs, not just of individual nations, but entire continents. Yeah. And this was the case with the company. The company had, you know, at one point, almost sort of 30% of, of the British economy. Mm. And, and it was the largest single employer in Britain, let alone India. In, Indi in England, yeah. you had sail makers, shipbuilders, people making tar, as well as the people making sacks for your spices mm. and loading the docks and running the ships and building the ships and all that sort of stuff. Um, so it's the biggest single employer in the country. Yeah. Um, and so one thing is, this, is uh, we're used again to the idea of corporations, as you mm. said at the beginning. But also there's this sense that the Brits have sort of woken up in the last 20 years too the big white elephant in their history mm. syllabus, which is, which is the absence of empire from the school curriculum to, as, as a core subject. Mm. And you cannot overestimate how important colonialism is to global history. It changed everything. And the British Empire transformed the world, the world, leaving aside the question of for better or worse, but just transformed everything it touched. Uh, across the globe, from New Zealand to Alaska. But also what you bring out, I think, which is particularly important, is the, the degree of uncertainty and unpredictability about that, that this is not a well-thought-out, na strategic, nas national decision, in a way. 
Absolutely. It's, it's totally contingent on... And, and even in the, in the major events like Plassey, mm. so nearly didn't happen. You know, the, every, in, I mean, in, there's an advantage to that in the sense that the EIC's um, relationship with Clive is deeply kind of invested in the fact that they could disown him if things didn't work out. But if it did, uh, it was all in their favour. And what I find fascinating is that, you know, you have in this period, this history, whereby... Um, elephants, durbars, maharajas, massive uh, campaigns, Warren Hastings sending off armies in one direction, Tipu Sultan, the Marathas, the Red Fort in Delhi. And yet, behind all that, and the epaulets, and the, the mm. bulls and governor's house, uh, governor general's house, all around, behind all that, there's the share price of the East India yeah. Company, like a, a blip going across a, a hospital screen. With yeah. the, it's the heartbeat of the, of the company. The go, and, and, you know, and when there's a defeat, the share price goes down. And when there's a, uh, uh, a victory, it goes up. And these guys play that, most famously Clive himself. Clive yeah. is coming out to be governor general for his third time in India in 1764, and he arrives at Madras mm. to find that the news has just arrived in a packet for him that the victory of Buxar. Mm. And not only has the Nawab of Bengal been defeated again, but also the Mughal Emperor, Shah Alam, mm. and the, uh, the Nawab of Avad, Shujo Dawla. Yeah. All three have been defeated. The whole of North India now, 1764, is at the feet of the company. What does Clive do? He writes, first thing he does, I'm getting that note, is he sends a, he writes a letter in code to his stockbroker. <laughs> <laughs> Sell everything and yeah. buy company stock. <laughs> and it goes off by a fast packet ship that he, that he like a courier, the kind of, you know, yeah. uh, uh, and it reaches England before the news. So Clive <laughs> triples his fortune through insider trading <laughs> all over again. <laughs> It's all very familiar. It's all... <laughs> it's, it, this is a wonderful, wonderful account of history, and it's so complicated. It's so nuanced in multiple ways, and you weave all of these strands together um, into, um, really, I mean, it sounds trite um, if I use this metaphor, but it is a tapestry, a huge tapestry and a landscape of different interests and different... Um, kinds of impetus coming together. Um, uh, you know what I'm going to ask you, don't you? Go ahead. What's, yeah. what's in the future for yeah. the anarchy? <laughs> well, would you care to share with our audience Well, here? <laughs> we have had an approach from a film, well, a variety of filmmakers, but one in particular who recently has done a, uh, quite a lot of sort of battles on, uh, on screen. I'm not going to say <laughs> anything more, uh, but it, I think it will be becoming either a movie or a TV series, which would be very nice. But oh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, these things often fall apart. So let's, uh, I'm not counting any chickens. Do we need to get the audience and, and swear them to silence <laughs> at this Deadly point? Silence. <laughs> Buy shares. In... <laughs> Buy shares quick. <laughs> well, Anarchy I... Inc. But. Uh, <laughs> But I've, having done these four books over 20 years, I've now just completed a, a completely different book. You've gone in a very yeah. different direction with this one, which this is, I'm this hugely is looking for. Utterly, utterly different, and, um, but a world I've always loved and been longing to write about. Um, and it's, this, it's a kind of a massively wide-angle look at ancient India. Mm. And the way that ancient India, like ancient Greece... And we're taught about ancient Greece in our mm. schools. We know, you know, Archimedes and Eureka and, and, and you know, the Parthenons, uh, the shadow of the Parthenon changing every building mm. across Europe for centuries. But we don't know the equivalence of how Indian civilization did that. And even people in India don't really mm. know. Although there's sort of, you know, enormous pride in the feeling that India hasn't quite got its sort of um, uh, message out. Yeah. But there's, there's, it's called The Golden Road. And it's the story of how I'm putting forward the, the idea that the 
Silk Roads, mm -hmm. which are so famous, did not exist in the early classical period. But instead, mm -hmm. the main direction of east-west travel uh, happened not with China. Rome and China had no idea that the other existed. Mm. Uh, instead, it happened through India. Yeah. And we now know that maybe a third of the Roman economy came from the customs take of Indian goods passing uh, mm. into Roman territory at the Red Sea. So vast was the, uh, the scale of the ivory, the pepper, the spices, the nard from the Himalayas, mm. and other extremely expensive luxury goods that were coming from India into the Roman Empire. And um, at a later period, after the, the kind of fall of Rome and the whole shake-up that happens with the uh, with the collapse of, 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 the, uh, of the Eastern Empire. Mm -hmm. um, India then swings its, its attention. The Golden Road, in a sense, reverses and looks eastwards. So that's the moment that you get Indian, Sanskrit, mm. Hindu ideas debouching into the Mekong Delta, ending ultimately with the largest Hindu temple in the world being built not in India, but in Angkor Wat in Cambodia. Mm. Yeah. And this whole idea of an Indosphere, this area of Indian influence, where Sanskrit is the courtly language all the way from Kandahar to Singapore mm. and Bali. And um, the three particular parts of the book, part one is the story of Buddhism starting in the Nepal-Indian mm -hmm border area on the Ganges plain and how that becomes the first great world religion spreading into yeah. China and taking over China so that with the yeah. Empress Wu Zetian in the late 7th century China becomes a Buddhist kingdom mm. with Indian monks running a lot of the show and, and with Buddhism comes Indian ideas of yugs and the whole cosmology of Jambudvipa yeah. the use of Sanskrit, the use of Prakrit the use of Indian astron astronomy and astrology and so on Part two is the story of Hinduism going to Southeast Asia. Mm -hmm. And part three is the story of Indian mathematics and zero and the numbers we use yeah. going first to the Arab world, to Baghdad, mm -hmm. and then from there crossing over the Mediterranean with no less a figure as Fibonacci. Mm. Fibonacci is a Pisan who is brought up in Algeria. His dad runs the customs house of the Pisans there. So he goes to the local school and picks up, as a matter of course, Arabic numbers, yeah. which have come from India. Uh, and he brings them back to, uh, to South Italy and the numbers we all use on our phones every day, the nearest thing that humanity has to a universal language, mm. which are those, those nine numbers plus zero, is an Indian invention. And we, we always imagine that they were invented by the Arabs, but they weren't. The Arabs yeah. knew very well that they came from India. It's, it's absolutely fascinating. When can we read this? September. <laughs> <laughs> so at this point, I think we'll open up for questions. Um, let's have a show of hands of questions in the room. Um, let's take the lady in front first. State where I was. <laughs> Hi, um, that was fascinating. Um, what are the, what's the le main legacies of the East India Company in British politics today? I think that the idea that a corporation can buy its way to influence and can effectively, through campaign donations, through the honours system, um, buy its way into influencing policy has to be and it, it, it's a very complicated legacy because at once it's obviously deeply corrupt, but it's also the fuel which keeps democracy going. Do you ban campaign donations? You know, uh, uh, it's, it's, so, so I think the, the, the corrupting of parliament. And what I love about the East India Company and its history is the, is the sense that we know it in our history books, as far as we know it at all, for fighting its wars mm. in India, and Plassey and Buxa and all the rest of it. But its influence here is so corrosive and so long-lasting 
You could argue that the entire lobbying system uh, internationally comes from the pioneering corruption of the East Indian Company. <laughs> <laughs> it's really not too far-fetched to say that. <laughs> Wonderful. So. Um, can we have... Can we have the gentleman at the back, perhaps? The person in the yeah. T-shirts, thank you. Thank you. Hi. Um, I wanted to ask, I don't know if this is a silly question or not, but how did the uh, English Civil War and interregnum period affect the East India Company as it was kind of becoming a thing? So the, the East India Company and all the other city corporations are solidly behind Parliament and, and donate their funds to Parliament. And it's, it, it, it doesn't make a huge difference to the East India Company, but the company which has the best story from the Civil War is the Levant Company, which is its cousin, and a lot of the same directors. Joint investors. Yeah, joint investors. So a lot of people like Thomas Smythe mm -hmm. are also functionaries of the Levant Company. And there you've got an extraordinary story, which is a story I'm longing to write at some point, about Henry Hyde. Do you know yeah. all this stuff? Yeah. <laughs> uh, and Henry Hyde, who is a cousin of you know, the Hydes of Hyde Park, and is a royalist and a toff, um, is damned if he's going to support Parliament. And he has made a fortune importing currants from the Peloponnese. The Tudors loved, loved currants in their cooking. And... He's made a huge fortune, and he's realised that he can buy his way, in the same way that the company is sort of you know, buying its way into influence in India, he buys the Ottoman governorate of the Peloponnese and has his own force of janissaries and his own navy. And he uses that to attack his own company, the Levant Company. So you have Hyde mm. leading Ottoman forces attacking the Smyrna factory and, the, and various other places. And he wins the war in the Mediterranean, but of course the royalists lose the war here. Um, so he finds himself you know, king of all he can survey in, in the eastern Mediterranean, but Cromwell's running <laughs> London. Um, and in the end, Cromwell, the Cromwellians send a sort of Mossad-style or SAS-style snatch squad to the Peloponnese <laughs> and kidnap him. Uh, and bring him back to Tower Hill where he's executed. And that's a good story for another day. <laughs> <laughs> Shall we get a couple of questions from our online audience at this point, perhaps, before returning here? Sure. So Becky Williams, who's watching online, says, was there a turning point where the British East India Company became politically interested in India in addition to creating an economic monopoly? So from the beginning, it is in involved in Indian politics, whether it's replacing rulers. And there's a point in the 1720s and 30s when both the Compagnie des Andes and the East India Company are making more money through offering themselves out as a mercenary operation, um, being involved in, 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 in the rise and fall of, of, of different rulers and, and allying with Hyderabad against the Carnatics or whatever it is, or different claimants to the throne than they actually make through trade. Mm. So from the beginning, they're into trade. The story we haven't dealt with, which is a fascinating story, is how the East India Company, um, rather like the horrible um, uh, uh, creature in Alien, the movie Alien, how it starts off as that nasty worm in John Hurt's um, <laughs> thorax uh, and uh, turns itself into the kind of mother creature that, that takes on Sigourney Weaver. Uh, uh, the East India Company does a version of that. <laughs> and it starts off selling spices. That's the sort of John Hurt moment yeah. in, in, uh, in Indonesia, what we call Indonesia. And then it's basically kicked out of that by the Dutch. And for the first time in the 1640s, it becomes an organisation selling textiles in India. And that's a major change. It's a, you know, that it's moved from the worm to yeah. the slightly bigger sort of creature, and shedding its skin in the, <laughs> in the spaceship. Uh, and uh, then it realises that having conquered Bengal in the 1750s, that no longer does it need to send out gold from London, 
to buy the textiles and the spices and all the stuff, it's, all the merchandise that it's paying for. Instead, it just taxes your ancestors. Yeah. Uh, and through ta overtaxing Bengalis, it raises the money to buy the spices or the textiles. Yes. So it becomes a sort of uh, a governing imperial corporation yeah. using land rents. And then it has a final transformation in the 1780s when it realizes that on top of that, that there's whole areas of marginal land which are not being used and it can plant a crop that mm. thrives in the margins and that is opium. So it finally ends up as the sort of 18th century Pablo Escobar in, in frock coats <laughs> um, and becomes the largest narco operator in yeah. the world. And again... Uh, and that's the moment when Sigourney Weaver, in the shape of the uh, uh, <laughs> parliament, decides <laughs> that enough's enough. And in 1858, it's rolled up. Yeah. And Leadenhall Street is closed down. The Navy, the, the East India Company shipping line is sold off. And the Raj begins. But the kind of weird bit of this story is that, you know, in our education, we're always taught about the British Raj. Mm. The British Raj, when the government is in charge, only lasts 90 years. Yeah. 1858 to 1947. It's a very small part. 90 years. It's yeah. a flick of the eye of Indian history. While the East India Company is the bit of the iceberg below the water, it's 250 years. Can we take another question from the room? Um, perhaps, gentleman down here, yeah, um, second row. Oh, we need a microphone. We just need oh, the mic for the online audience as well. China stayed one polity for about 2,000 years. Uh, why did India, why did the Mughals never try and get right down to the south and stay one company and fight off the British and the French? Very. The way the, the, way the Chinese did. Very, very interesting and very important point. India, for most of its history, is not one political unit. For most of its history, it's uh, thousands of different... When Xuanzang, the Chinese monk, appears in the 7th century, he says, I'm now entering India. He's at Jalalabad, which is now in Afghanistan. He says, I'm now entering India, uh, a region of 70, uh, 70 states. Uh, and that's the norm in India for most of history. Moments like the Guptas, the Mauryans, and the Mughals are the exceptional moments when things... The Mughals do try very hard to get to the south, as do the Mauryans, but they never quite make it. China, in contrast, is, for most of its history, one state with moments of disruption, the, the warring states and so on. And the other big surprise is that Southeast Asia, which I'm writing a lot about in The Golden Road, is also for its, the great part of its, uh, most important part of its history, the Khmer period, one state. So today we have Thailand, Laos, Vietnam, um, Burma, and all the rest of it, and it's all split up, while India is this enormous chunk of one country. For most of the important parts of the Middle yeah. Ages, it's the reverse. Southeast Asia is one country, and India is fractured. Um, and you're right, it's a very, very important and crucial difference between the two. But from the very, very early time, there is recognition of India as a single cultural unit and religious unit. And India's shape, like Italy's shape, creates a geographical reality hemmed in by mountains to the north with an island to the south and a self-contained area. So people recognise India as a thing, but it's not one state. I think that's a really important point, yeah. isn't it? That really India important. as a conceptual entity and a political entity are two di different things yeah. and operate in different ways. Yeah. Let's take one final question from the online audience before we wrap up. Sure. So Asha online says, will there ever be any recognition of the East India Company building to mark its existence? Well, if I was <laughs> Prime Minister, <laughs> yes. I think it should do. I think it's one mm. of the most important things in British history. And it's ridiculous that, you know, some typographer on my street has got a blue plaque, but the East India Company hasn't. <laughs> um, 
Yes. I mean, who do we write to? Sadiq Khan. <laughs> <laughs> well, on that note, um, and with that on the to-do list, can we all thank, <laughs> thank, um, thank Will Dalrymple for this wonderful conversation. <laughs>